This meeting is being recorded. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Barry Kostrinsky, and this is an artist talk. Um, for the last few weeks, I've been gathering artists. One at a time to present for 30 minutes. We have Stephen Hirsch tonight. Um, uh, if you'd like to know more, you'd like to reach out, you, you may have my email. Um, our talks are every Monday for August, but starting September and October, I'm gonna to move to uh, Tuesday at the same time. Uh, uh, I want to welcome Stephen. Stephen's a photographer that, you know, it, it's constraining. A lot of photographers say, I'm an artist who uses photography, but Stephen's a photographer and an artist who uses photography. And he's also turned a painter or drawer. Uh, uh, it, I couldn't encapsulate it in a few words. It's both very simple and very brilliant, um, what you do, Stephen. And I look forward. Stephen's going to present for about 30 minutes, and he does have a solid presentation in that. We'll, we'll sort of listen. I'll, I'll comment a little, but we'll chime in at the end with our questions. We'll have plenty of times. Uh, of course, you can use the chat uh, for any thoughts you have. And uh, I just want to welcome you, Stephen. And I do want to mention Travis Lindquist is coming next week. And I have a website that's sort of up, but I'll publicize it soon where you can see who's spoken and who's to speak. So Stephen, welcome and thanks. Thanks for giving you time. Thank you, Barry. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. And um, I, I I wrote some notes. So if I kind of look off to the side a bit, um, it's because I did write some notes. I am going to, um, I guess, share my screen. Let's just start off doing that. Um, well, that didn't work. No, it did, it did. It's totally working. Oh, what, yeah. am, what are you looking at? Oh, I see you moving. Uh, oh, yeah. US okay. two thing. Yeah, it's totally working. Yeah, but I need to find uh, my photographs. There we go. There you go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can get to the beginning of all this. Welcome to all the uh, newcomer Stephen Hurst presenting. We'll hold all questions sort of to the end. Um, and of course, feel free to use the chat. And just do okay, be conscious. So, yeah. Go ahead, Stephen, sorry. Thank you. Okay, not a problem. Um, so do I have a full screen of this picture? Um, I don't know what you're seeing. Learn so are you seeing stop on the screen? That's Damn. good. You're at 50% of screen. Vertical, you're 100% just about. That's as good as it's going to get. Okay. Um, so I, I put together some notes and I wanted to talk a little bit about what I do and um, how I got to where I am. So um, I'm a photographer and I've been a photographer my whole life. Um, I started photographing when I was probably 15 years old in high school. Um, I had a mentor in high school who took me into a dark room and um, she showed me how to print and how to do well, how to print in a dark room. And, um, and I started doing photography when I was 15 and I lived out in Queens. I grew up in Brooklyn, lived out in Queens then. And I used to travel into Manhattan to go photograph uh, after school and on the weekends and things like that. And, um, and I, I made street photographs. I, I grew up across the street in Brooklyn from an insane asylum. And um, I've told the story so many times, it's kind of funny, but I grew up across the street from an insane asylum and I would meet uh, outpatients on the street all the time and have conversations with them. And um, I would just, I, I, I probably I was like eight years old, so I wasn't photographing yet. And I would just stare at them and I was just in awe of like their stories and what they look like and the things that they told me, the way that they dressed. One of them was dressed up in an army uniform and had an airplane and a picture of Douglas MacArthur around his neck and um, told me he was Douglas MacArthur. And that was kind of like a real um, monumental time in my life because it kind of formed the the interest that I had in in people and odd characters that I would kind of photograph for the rest of my life. And some of the pictures that I'm going to show are really a result of meeting these 
these characters from the insane asylum. I don't I don't know what you call an insane asylum today. I'm I don't think I'm woke enough to even know. And um, do you want to you want to run through a couple of more images, Stephen? Yeah. So th this is uh, in Manhattan. These are all shot probably in the '90s. And these are some of the characters that I would see that reminded me of the characters when I was a child. And every one of them is a little quirky looking, a little different looking. And this guy certainly, everybody tells me he looks like Robin Mitchum. And, and, and maybe in fact, he was. But I love the cigarette uh, ashes all over his tie and his jacket and the dangling cigarette and things like that. Um, so these are, Again, some of the people I'd photographed, this was in probably Soho or downtown. So I was attracted to characters, women who would dress up, guys who would dress up, anybody who looked odd and different and unusual. And almost everybody to me looks odd, different and unusual. I was always kind of like, this is in the garment center. Uh, and I was always kind of um, interested in people who were going to work and, and the fact that they'd be out in a day like today in suits and ties and sweating their brains out. So it just amazed me that people could actually dress up when it's a hundred degrees out or something like that. I don't remember anything of why this woman has all these shoes in her hand. I think she was at a stand something trying to buy shoes and just grabbing everything imaginable. So that was mostly in the 80s, 70s, 90s that I would shoot black and white. Um, I idolized uh, Gary Winogrand and Lee Friedlander and uh, Robert Frank. And these were street photographers who went out and did that same kind of photography, going out and photographing people on the street. New Yorkers, mostly they all like lived in New York and and photographed in New York most of their lives. And, and these are the people who I idolized. And so then in the, um, in the 90s and, and into the new century, I started doing mostly color because digital cameras came out and um, you could shoot a lot more and a lot cheaper. You didn't have to change film. You didn't have to uh, print film. You didn't have to go in the dark room anymore. I ditched my dark room and Things were now on the computer. So I love that whole era of changing over to digital and, and getting access to be to um, the instantaneous image that you could make. It reminded me of Polaroids and I did shoot Polaroids for quite a while. So it kind of reminded me of the Polaroid era. So these were all taken on the streets. This is down in Soho also is one of my favorite spots to shoot. People get dressed up, they go out there and show off their clothes and what they look like. And some of this stuff was shot with flash. Well, a lot of it was shot with flash and that's where the strange lighting comes in, shot from below to give it that kind of stage lighting. Um, this is again is in Soho. People dressed up out for, you know, out for the day shopping, Gucci bags and, and uh, designer sweatshirts and things like that, all dressed up, having their hair done. Everybody's out there prancing around. It's it's like a runway. <laughs> um, most of my pictures remind me of things that went on in my head or go on in my head. And that continues to today. So everything is kind of, in a certain way, autobiographical. Um, the, the characters come from photographing the mental patients, not photographing them, but seeing the mental patients on the streets in Brooklyn when I grew up. Um, this reminds me of my mother you know, dragging me along as a young boy. And um, though I have to say my mother never dressed me up that slick. So um, this was at a street festival, I think down in uh, Little Italy. And um, this woman, I think she has three cups <laughs> and ran out of hands. So, um, in 2010, um, I took a trip to, I grew up in Brooklyn, but I'd never been to probably most of Brooklyn. I think growing up, I spent most of my time in Jewish delis eating kosher food or something like that, pastrami sandwiches. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I don't remember seeing a lot of Brooklyn. Uh, yeah, going to the aquarium once in a while and Prospect Park and the zoo and things like that. 
but I'd never seen Stephen, the Guam. Would you say? Would you say you photographed pastrami sandwich culture? <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. I still live <laughs> pastrami sandwich culture, even though I don't eat pastrami sandwiches. Um, but um, so a friend of mine took me to um, the Gowanus, the Gowanus Canal. And I, I guess I, I've heard of the Gowanus Canal. I mean, I lived in Brooklyn until I was 13. And the Gowanus Canal might have well been in like, you know, France for all I knew. So um, I didn't know where it was, what it was, a, a canal. I was expecting to see people with, you know, gondolo, gondolas and, and uh, you know, with, you know, little caps and rowing through the place and stuff. It wasn't anything like that. And um, so we sat down on the side of the, um, the canal. This is an important time in my life, taking these pictures or an important day, because it really changed things going forward a lot. And I only shot 15 photographs that day, and it was all shot with a little point and shoot camera. But I sat by the side of the canal, and then oil started bubbling up. And and um, and this is one of the pictures of the bubbling oil that was in the water, which was the pollution, obviously, of the canal, which I found out later was one of the most polluted waterways in the world. And so this was like right in front of me, and I, I made some photographs of it. Again, I only made about 15 photographs that day because I just, this wasn't something that I really did or I was that interested in. And I really never had a sense of even photographing them, what they would look like, like they would come out looking like this. Um, I think I'm showing the same pictures again. Uh, yeah. So, um, so these pictures, these were the first pictures and they were shot in 2010. They were in a camera. I never paid attention to them. I put them in my uh, database, my catalog, and, and I didn't look at them again. In 2014, um, I got an email from Nico Capel. Nico Capel was a photo editor at the New York Times, and he was in charge of doing the, the arena page, which I think they still do today, actually, on the Sunday Times. So it was a full page dedicated to a photographer and the photographer's work. And Nico, who I never knew, uh, wrote me and said, um, I'd like to publish your work on the arena. And I said, well, that's great. What, would, what are you interested in publishing? He said, well, I like the projects that you were doing before, which was courthouse confessions, which were pictures of uh, defendants at court coming out of court. And they would tell me their stories. And the Times actually published um, a story on it uh, of that project. And I guess that's how he knew my work. And I had done a project called Krusty Punks and another project called uh, Little Sticky Lick, which was Krusty Punks was people who lived, drug addicts who lived in Tompkins Square Park. They let me hang out with them and become part of their crowd and let me photograph them and um, shooting heroin and doing all kinds of bizarre things. And um, that got published. And then another project I did, which was along the same lines, was called uh, Little Sticky Legs. And Little Sticky Legs was um, a project which was photographs of people who were abducted or said they were abducted by aliens. And um, years earlier, I photographed for the National Enquirer and the Globe, which was also a, um, a formative time for me, shooting for them for about 10 years and, and photographing some bizarre stories. And one of them was people who said they were abducted by aliens at a convention in Connecticut. <clears throat> well, I was looking for more projects to do and that came into my head. And then I went to the Southwest to a UFO convention and drove around Arizona and Nevada and New Mexico looking for people who said they were abducted by aliens and did that project. Uh, so Nico loved all this work. So he said, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I'm doing a project on people who are abducted by aliens. He said, well, that's not a New York story. So I, I'm not interested in that, but I need a New York story to publish. And um, I started thinking and I said, well, I took these pictures about four years before. This was 2014. And I said, I took these pictures in 2010 and um, I'll look for them and I'll send them to you. So this was one of the pictures from that group and he published them on the arena page. And um, 
then I got interested in doing more of the Gowanus after that. And this was now 2014. So um, I had a high resolution camera and I'd go out with a, with a tripod, which was very unusual for me to do any kind of work like that and started shooting the canal. And this is one of the pictures from the canal that was shot four years later. So the pictures were different. They became, I don't know, in a certain way more sophisticated, I think, and more abstract. Well, not more abstract, but maybe more sophisticated. And um, so this was this is one of them. This is another. And another. And so this this is just obviously a small part of the entire project. Um, there were literally thousands of pictures that I shot. So this is just to give you an idea what I was doing. So um, I did this project and I had a show of it and I got a book published of it uh, from Powerhouse Books. Um, and then I was kind of trying in my head to figure out like I had done the portrait projects of Krusty Punks and, and uh, Little Sticky Legs and Courthouse Confessions. I was looking to kind of now move on to something that was similar um, because I started to think thematically that I was doing projects now and because of what I had done before. And when I was photographing on the street, there were never projects, there were never themes. There were just random photographs that were taken of people on the street. So um, this kind of changed the direction I was moving in, which was thematic. And, and so now I was saying to myself, well, what can I do? So what I did was I started going to, at first, um, I started going into um, galleries where people were painting on the walls and flippantly painting all over their studios and started asking them if I can photograph the excess paint of their studios. And this was uh, one of them. This was actually in a children's painting studio in uh, I believe Brooklyn Heights. Uh, this was um, in um, a studio in um, somebody's painting studio. And this was actually on the edge of a sofa. So the background is actually leather and the paint was just all the paint flying all over this guy's sofa. And now, Stephen, so these are quite yeah. beautiful. And the other images of the oil slicks are quite beautiful. They're different, but they're playing in a similar sort of psychedelic cosmic space. It's quite interesting that, you know, one is oil spills and the other is kids sort of, you know, the leftover paint as you call it. Um, great photos that you capture. Yeah, they're very psychedelic because I took a lot of psychedelics. So anyway. Um, you saved me a question. Thank you. <laughs> so these were, um, I actually, I would go out searching for places to go photograph. This was, um, I believe, in a children's painting studio in Portland, Oregon. So I actually would go out and look for artists who uh, I would ask if I could go into the studios. And I went to a couple of children's uh, painting studios and um, this is uh, from one of them. Um, and actually, I would, this was going on probably for about six months. I would travel around Brooklyn just jumping into dumpsters. So I was, I was photographing the, um, the rust and the paint and all the things that were in the walls of dumpsters. I would go to Williamsburg and, and to Greenpoint and photograph the sides of trucks and graffiti and things like that, just oil stains. I mean, it was, it was almost everything. Um, and sort of like, sort of like the Bonard of dumpster diving. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, it's a, it's a funny story. I was dumpster diving, actually. And then when I went out to, this is a very short, funny story. I went out to um, uh, Arizona to go photograph the um, UFO convention to photograph the people abducted by aliens. And while I was out there on the way to the convention center, or it was actually a hotel, um, I saw a dumpster in the back of a paint store and I kind of thought that that might be interesting. And when I got there and looked inside, it was all these cans of paint that were thrown in there and the cans of paint had splattered all over the dumpster. So the dumpster was literally a gold mine of what this project was, which I eventually called it splat. And so, um, so I was, yeah, I was dumpster diving. 
So um, this was an, yet another project. I'm always looking for things to do. I'm always open to, uh, to visions and, and seeing things that I don't think people can see um, and that I could see somehow. And, and um, I was in, um, in Rockaway and um, I photographed through a telescope on the boardwalk, people on the beach. And this is kind of funny because it looks like an angel. So, um, Stephen, I got to tell you, if I could just capture that last thought that you put out about what your intention is in trying to capture and just loop it and play it for five minutes, you'd have a good piece. You would think you'd awaken some people. I forgot what I said, Baron. Yeah, but it's on tape. <laughs> okay. I'll have to watch the video. Uh, anyway, so this was shot, shot with a, I, I had an iPhone. I was going. Uh, home and and there's a telescope on the beach one of these kinds that you look through and you put you know a coin in but this one was free thank god because i shot a lot of pictures through it um and it was labor day and um i had it my iphone and i took the iphone and i put it up to the viewfinder of the telescope and and these are some of the pictures that were shot from that hmm Okay, so um, another transition of how I got to painting. Now we'll get into uh, painting. So this is acrylics on canvas, and and how did I get there? So I, I guess I would have to backtrack a little bit to this. So when I was doing this, and I'm leaving out a lot of steps in between, obviously, but when I was doing this project, um, I would look for things that I could photograph that looked like paintings. And I was interested in creating paintings i would make these into giant prints they would be 60 inches long so you know paintings are all large these days or a lot of them are so i wanted to really copy the look of paintings but without paint so um i, I made thousands of these pictures and and literally um i got tired of doing it going to uh the train to brooklyn and walking around for hours and hours looking for grease stains and you know uh graffiti fractions of graffiti and just a lot of things i just got i was doing it for a long time maybe a year or two the dumpsters and all kinds of stuff and i'd go out in the middle of the summer and it was like today it was boiling out and it was it was difficult to do so um one day i was in uh, chelsea going to some galleries and there was a a piece of plastic that was on the side of a wall and it was an invitation to somebody's show and the person uh painted on the plastic and the show was already over. And so I, I took it down. I took it with me, the piece of uh, Lucite with a, it wasn't painted really. It was just, just, you know, kind of parts of paint on it. And I took it with me and I took it home. And then I started trying to figure out how can I do this at home without going outside? Because I just got tired of all, you know, all these trips that I would make all the time to go photograph. And so I started building sets in my apartment with the painting on the Lucite and I started using the Gowanus pictures underneath as background. So I was layering them and I was lighting them with lights and tripods and you know all kinds of stuff and high resolution cameras. And I started making pictures in my apartment that were the same kind of like genre as the splat paintings or photographs, I should say. Um, and I started creating them in my apartment and uh, from pieces I had seen and, and um, pieces I was using from some of these images that I was taking, I would layer them and so on and so forth. And then one day I just said like, well, you know, enough's enough. And I was visiting a friend out in, in, um, in Williamsburg and she's a painter and she likes my work. And she said, you know, you should just paint. And you know, you, you're just doing something like copying painting. Why don't you just paint? And I said, well, I don't know how to paint. I'm, I'm a photographer. I have no idea how to paint. So she was she was so kind to me she went over to her um, her table and took just like dozens of paint and put it in front of me gave me brushes gave me uh little canvases to paint on so on and so forth just kind of like almost like i walked into blick and just like said here here's what you do just take all this stuff and just start painting and i said i have no idea how to paint she goes don't worry well, about by it. the way by the way that's the stephen hirsch mfa program in a nutshell, that was probably employed in one third of the years in MFAs in the 1980s. 
save you, save you, save you a hundred thousand dollars in the MFA program. So it's uh, so true, though. It's so true. Yes. So it, it is true, and and it, it reminds me of a story when I went out to San Francisco, the San Francisco Art Institute, in my mid twenties, because I thought if I got a degree in photography, an MFA, that maybe I could teach photography and I can get a job other than driving a cab. And I went to um, the San Francisco Art Institute and I met with the head of the MFA program. And I said, I want to get into the program. And he said that you're better than the teachers. So I don't think you should come here. <laughs> he said, you'd be wasting your money and wasting your time. And, and I was pretty disappointed because I didn't know how I can get a job after that. But I kind of listened to him. Um, anyway, getting back to the painting. So I started, I started painting. I just, I took the paints home and, and I just started painting and, and, um, and I started painting abstracts like what you see in front of you now, because I thought, well, this is what I was photographing and maybe this is what I should paint. So, um, Nancy, who, uh, Nancy Golowinski, who is on, uh, the, on the screen here somewhere, I don't know where. Hi, Nancy. Uh, was sort of my mentor and on Instagram would tell me, well, this looks like that uh, painter and this looks like that painter and this looks like Sam Francis. And I remember Sam Francis distinctively because I started trying to, looking at Sam Francis, loved his work and tried to paint. And this is similar to something he would do and started painting like Sam Francis a little bit. And then I just said like, it was good, but it was just like, I felt like I was just making copies of the things that I was photographing. And I wasn't really into abstracts. I was more into figurative. So it was like, well, what am I doing? And then I just started painting figures and I started painting things and I started painting people. And I just stopped painting any abstracts. It lasted about a week and I, I just stopped doing it. And this was, I'm sorry, one of the first ones uh, that I had done. Um, so, um, I work at the New York Post as a photographer and I've been there for uh, over 25 years. And um, it's a pretty amazing job. I got it after working at the tabloids for about 10 years. And it kind of like, I did all kinds of things photographically to make a living. I started doing a lot of portraits and things like that. And then one day I got a job working at the paper after this crazy job that I'd done for them temporarily. And, um, and I would go to, to amazing events and meet amazing people and just have an amazing time, just like seeing the world uh, through a camera lens uh, for a newspaper. It was just like the greatest job ever. And I still do it today. Um, I photograph down at the courthouse full time. I photograph criminals, murderers and, and all kinds of things. And I use them as studies for a lot of my paintings today. Um, but this was a photograph that or taken from a photograph uh, that I used as a study of an Indian chief who came to the courthouse to a civil trial uh, of somebody who was suing the carriage drivers in Central Park and trying to get them to stop. And this, this Indian chief came and he was testifying about horses and the beauty of horses and things like that in court. So he was an expert witness in the court and he was dressed up like this in the court. So um, he was one of the first paintings that I made of, of somebody and it. A lot of it came from uh, things that I had photographed and things that I had seen. Uh, this one, uh, again, uh, the, the two people, the couple on the right are uh, photo, uh, photo, were photographs or taken from a photograph study of people who were in the Krusty Punks project. So, um, and then the people, they look like models when they, especially when they pose. So um, I just kind of thought I'd put them together with some other real models and in a painting. So, um, no, it's funny, Stephen, in that last painting, you know, I liked the painting, but I was like taken by the shoes at the bottom and almost, I just want to see the shoe play that you got going on because it's quite interesting. Um, yeah, you sort of have a, a very true hand. And you're relaxed, I think, because you didn't go to school. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't know what to do. Actually, I don't, I, I still don't know how to paint. Uh, and, 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 you know, it just came naturally to just kind of like try to, you know, in many ways, it's because I was a photographer that I would just try to copy photographs, you know, and, and, and make 
paintings of them. Um, and then I just started thinking of fantasies in my mind. So I, I dream a lot. I have a lot of fantasies. Um, you know, um, like, like I said, I took psychedelics. So there's a lot of things in my head that just, um, I see visions. I don't see visions. I don't walk around seeing visions, but I see things that, um, that I want to paint or I want to photograph that um, I, as a painter, you can recreate. And a photographer, you, yes, you can make things like, um, you know, setups and, and studio setups and, and Joe Peter Wicken kind of photographs and things like that. And if you don't know his work, you should look at it because nobody sets up a photograph like <laughs> Joe Peter Wicken. But I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to paint. And I was falling in love with painting. And I used to fish a lot and I fell in love with fishing. Uh, I fished a lot when I was a kid. So fishing is very dear to me. And um, and then I just started thinking in my head, like, what do, what do I want to paint? And then it was like, well, maybe paint people who are fishing or holding fish because posing with fish became a big deal. So um, and then I, I didn't want to do it like logically in a boat or something like that or by the water. So I just decided I'd want to paint somebody standing in a very colorful forest and, and of course, naked. Um, as I said, I work for the newspaper. I photograph a lot of murders and, and, and a lot of murder victims or families of victims come to court and give victim impact statements. So um, I, I'm fascinated by murders and murder scenes and murderers. Um, and this is a, a painting of, in the turn of the century, photographers used to go to scenes of murder scenes and they would photograph with a giant tripod and they would always photograph like straight down. They would get, and you can see the legs of the tripod on the top and the bottom, and they would get above the person and they would shoot straight down. Uh, and I found it so interesting because the angles uh, were so odd and so different to be able to look at somebody laying out like that who's dead. And so I attempted to paint them uh, in this death scene. And um, and here we here we go with fishing again. And uh, so this has fishing. Um, and it has Godzilla in it because I grew up watching horror movies when I was a kid. My father would take me to see horror movies and cowboy movies every Saturday uh, at the movie theaters in downtown Brooklyn. And um, I think this was if there was a flyover like in New York over I can see over the Hudson or the west side from my apartment and there was a flyover and so that's incorporated in there and um oh there's a fish on the bottom a swordfish coming out of the lake which of course they don't live in and i traveled to to canada northern canada canada rockies and canadian rockies and so that's incorporated so there's like all these things and and my love of blondes of course naked blondes which you'll see throughout all of a lot of my paintings and a question about this battery <laughs> Um, no, thank you for the politically correct qualification on that. <laughs> well, that's unusual for me. Uh, so, uh, so this is a, um, uh, a this was a study from a drawing of one of the people when I went to do the people who are abducted by aliens. I was um, I brought a pad. I did it one year, and then the next year I brought a, a drawing pad with me, which was interesting because I wasn't even drawing at that point or painting or doing anything. And um, this was about a year before I started painting. And I asked the people who are abducted by aliens to draw or make a drawing of their abduction by aliens. And so this was um, a study from one of their drawings, which doesn't look much like their drawing at all, but. Um, and, and then uh, this was their, my idea of what the aliens might look like. Steven, that's a very different painting than everything you've shown. This is all, this is acrylics. So at first I was painting with all acrylics and on canvas. Um, is it different? Yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I don't Barry, know. Barry, why do you think it's different? Um, you're, you're using the expressionistic brush with mixed colors. And I don't know, there's, it's there's more, more of a, more of a painterly approach or painterly speak and presence than an image presence if you're in the hair 
and you go down to the left and then pick up the background and go around and your face you've painted them in pasto and again that pushes it forward instead of backwards into narrative so you're in the you're in the uh the sort of uh formal narrative painting uh, which is pure painting i would say um so i i see that difference and yes it enca you're encapsulating your quick hand especially the hand that you've painted there um but there's something maybe it's the scale of the brush stroke too that it's I, I think you, i think you hit it on the head it has less to do with the photographs uh like the previous ones or this one this was more photographic. I mean, it's more like me, me making a photograph in my head and then putting the pieces together, the collage together and putting it together. And I, you're right, this becomes more free form, I think. Um, and I guess moving forward, that's more what I was doing with acrylics. And um, and so I was always looking for subjects to, to do and I became fascinated by uh, people who were missing because at court, there would be cases where people were missing, or there was a, a, a case on the Upper East Side, Irene Silverman, who was um, a very wealthy woman who lives in a townhouse, and a couple of grifters uh, called the uh, Kimeses. This is kind of a famous case, K-I-M-E-S. It was a mother and son. They were grifters, and they killed her, and they robbed her, and they, they made her sign over the um, house to them, and then she disappeared and she was never found again. And they were convicted and they were sent to jail. And Mary Tyler Moore actually played the mother in a movie, a little tidbit. So if you ever want to see um, the story about the kinds is you can find it by, I guess, I am the being Mary Tyler Moore and the kinds is. But anyway, so um, I went to the FBI site and I started looking for stories about missing people. And so they would have like an artist drawing of what a missing person looked like. And it was always, a, you know, an art sketch. They would shove a nose in there and they would shove, you know, a description of what the person looked like. And it was always kind of very crude. And they would say there what actually happened, where they were missing from. So I would um, then paint the description of the person and I would paint in the background the uh, area of where they were last seen. So the background is a map. I've done, a, I did a bunch of these. So the background is a map. And then the subject is the missing person. And then I would, it's on Instagram. So if you look at it, you'll see it on Instagram way back. And then I would put the FBI description of the person, how they were last seen, what they look like. You know, they would describe if they had dentures, wearing glasses, all kinds of weird descriptions of what they look like. Uh, and then, um, and so, and that's what I did. And then I just started painting these figures on the background and, and, and I don't, I don't know what they represent. I mean, the murderers or, or something like that. Um, and so I did a bunch of that. This was, there's a whole bunch of, them, but this was a couple that I liked. And, and this was a woman who was missing. And I think she was in, um, in uh, Tennessee because it was, it says the boyhood home of um uh who wrote oliver uh oliver twin um uh, no he, oliver oliver um oh i forgot I don't dickens know. dickens no. charles dickens what no. do you want oliver twist or mark twain or what do you want mark twain, mark twain, duh. okay mark twain, i'm sorry so this was uh the, you can see up on the top there it says the um the Boyhood Home, and it says The Boyhood Home of Mark Twain. So I think this is in Tennessee, if I'm not mistaken, or something like that. Anyway, this is a missing woman. And um, and again, I started using these dark figures in there of like, she was abducted or she was murdered, or I, I don't, I'm not quite sure what the dark figures represent. But again, Steve, the when, I, when I see the composition here, it brings back to the other sort of uh, celestial works that you did, where you both uh, did the oil spills and then the other work after it where you had these sort of uh, floating spaces. Here, it's the black obviously makes it much more present. And of course, her shirt, you know, there's everything in there, that repeated line with the variation and, you know, the little angles. It's, it's almost Aztec in a way. Oh, you're brilliant, aren't you? This one has a sense of planned composition. It's very striking, you know? 
uh, like you were thinking about where to put things, how dark, how light, what kind of space you're creating, movement of lines and patterns. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not freeform at all, yeah. No, but it's in, a, in its crudeness, it's kind of sophisticated. Yes. Um, so on March 11th, uh, 2020, um, a friend of mine came to my house and she brought over some uh, pencils and a coloring book that she had. <clears throat> and we, we were hanging out and she said, would you like to draw? And I Steven, said, yeah. Stephen, you've got yeah. good friends. Seems like your friends have like, here's the paint, Stephen. What do you do? Just, you know, they put it out for you. You should be a ceramicist one day. Uh. <laughs> I do have good friends. They all want me to be creative and help me through life. So anyway, she, she pulled out all the pencils, threw them on a table. I had nothing to draw on, so I got a piece of Xerox paper, you know, or copy paper, and I put it on the table. And th this was the first drawing that I ever done with pencils, and it was on March 11th, 2020, which was the first day of the pandemic, or the first official day of the pandemic. So this was my painting of the pandemic, or drawing, I should say, of the pandemic. So... Um, for the I was work I'm working at the courthouse I still do but I was working at the courthouse then and everybody just like ditched the courthouse everybody just like left and the place was deserted and I have a, a press room there that I work in and I kept going to work every day but there was nobody at the court anymore the court officers had left there was no more defendants nobody was there and I didn't quite know what to do because I'd go to work there so I just started going there to work and the next day after making this drawing um, I went over to Blick on Lafayette Street, and like I did when I started to learn how to paint, I, I basically went over and asked a salesperson, what should I buy? So when I started painting acrylics, she told me what to buy in brushes and acrylics. So this person said, well, if you want to draw, you should buy these watercolor pencils. I love them. They're great. You just draw with them, and then you could add water on them, and you can make them expand like watercolors. And so I, I bought them and she said, buy this paper. And I bought the paper. I listened to everything she said. I walked out spending like $250. And then I went back to the press room at the court. And for the next week and a half, I just sat in there getting paid, but, but drawing. And um, until like the Friday of the week after when all my friends said, you're insane, you need to go home. And I finally packed up all my equipment, went home. And I never came back for like six months. So when I when I got home, I started uh, paint. These are the watercolor pencils, and I started painting um, the pandemic. So um, so this is one of the first uh, drawings that I made. Well, it's actually the first drawing I made after that last one, after this, which was about a week and a half before with pencils, and this was a week and a half later with watercolor pencils. And um, I, I just love doing this. I just had such a ball. I, I, I loved moving the colors around and, and, and drawing and things like that. And, and like everybody else at that time in space, I was in such a panic about what the state of the world was and where we were going that I guess I thought we were just probably all going to die. So this was a picture of, of, you know, people like maybe like zombies or walking through space and time and Kind of walking in another world or something like that. I, I'm not sure what it represents, but it's all based on COVID. And if you look in the very left hand side, I started putting a signature of 19 in a lot of the drawings that I started doing going forward. And so this was all from this one week. I just started like drawing constantly. Like every day I would draw, I draw like maybe three, four, even five drawings in a day. Not even in a day, in an afternoon, because I, I just kind of like waste away the morning drinking coffee and reading newspapers. And so you can see all the 19s again, all around the um, the entire uh, drawing. Um, uh, people floating in the water, bodies floating in the water, and, um, you know, a lot of 19s and a lot of, a lot of people who look weirdly sick. <laughs> yeah. Steven, uh, I've got to go back to the point that you're making over and over again. And that, that's sort of a love for painting, a love for the material, a love for pushing paint. And uh, I, I'd say like, you know, you said it in the diarist at times. It wasn't that you like said, oh, let's go. Or, 
I might as well jump into this. You, you sort of love doing it. Um, is this play in the best way possible for you? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It also, you, you know, I, I didn't go out. I was trying to figure out a little while ago with my friend about how long did I stay in. And I think I literally stayed in for about six months. I, I was panicked. I mean, I, I looked out the window. There was no people outside. I would go out three o'clock in the morning to go shopping for food, have a car. I'd park in front of the building. There was nobody on the streets. I mean, the city was literally deserted like a bomb had taken out the entire town and just left all the buildings. It was insane. I went to uh, Morton Williams on Park Avenue. I was the only person shopping at three o'clock in the morning. And then I would come home and I would just paint every day. And I, there was nothing else to do. I mean, it was either that or read or watch television or something. And I just fell in love with drawing. And I just like, I found drawing at the perfect time to just start doing it. And I just would do it every day. So um, again, this is a, a COVID drawing all from the first week. Uh, I would manically draw and you can see COVID written on it, 19 and all that kind of stuff and floating bodies and just crazy stuff going on. And um, so I loaded up a lot of the, these first um, drawings from that period because I thought it was an interesting period for me, uh, a creative period and a very formative period for me. Um, Stephen, I'm going to do something odd. There's an artist here who also curates and curates often around color, Monroe Hodder. And I kind of ask her reaction because, you know, you're hitting us with some great images in so many different ways. But the color, you're sort of, your sense of strong color makes me think of you, Monroe. What's your thoughts? You know, I look at this woman in the red jacket and I think it's me. And I think that has to do with the fact that she's made out of color, you know? And I, I, I just completely identify with that woman. But I find, I find the way you use color is totally abandoning any rules or systems that might exist in the world. And it's so intuitive and free form that it's like a miracle. I think a lot of it has to do from being, you know, a color photographer. It's not, you know, I mean, I, I showed some of my work, uh, the outsider art fair a couple of years and was, I guess, considered an outsider or a brute artist. And, I, and, I, I, and I'm not sure I really am because I think as a photographer my whole life, I already knew how to form images and how to make, you know, and, and form design and, and use clothing and color and, and all kinds of things that I use as a photographer. And obviously this is much different than my photographs and that's why I included them at the beginning kind of get a sense of, you know, that I, I knew color and I knew design. So I again, think, I, Stephen, I, I, yeah. you know, I appreciate that, but I really think you're tapping into different sides. You know, there's different sides of your brain or you know, different parts in your photography um, compared to this work. Um, I may be totally wrong, but, uh, you know, and everybody has their own coloration. You know, and I joked about Bernard because of the tubs being like a dumpster, but you know, you're going after the yellows. I think you're fearless of color. And I think you use it, you know, you're using the real brights um, cause, you know, you want strength. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can start to see some COVID masks and some of these, I think people started wearing masks. There's a guy in there, uh, wearing a mask and, um, not quite the mask have, have not quite come out yet. Mm, wow. So, um, again, this is all the first week, the first week of drawing. Um, so now this is moving on and, and I, I started, um, drawing in, uh, like I said, March, 2020. Um, and after that, I never went back to acrylics. I mean, I use acrylics a little bit once in a while, just to kind of dab on a, a drawing and things like that. But I, I never went back to acrylics, no matter how much I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed the strokes and things like that. There's something about the flat quality of drawings. Um, that I find interesting. It's non-reflective. So you saw the earlier acrylics and you can see the reflections of the paint and the strokes and the brush strokes and things like that. I just think I wanted to do something different. And, and I just started um, uh, drawing 
all the time instead of painting. So the acrylics are just sitting in a bin now, and I think we'll probably all drying out by now. Um, this is another COVID uh, drawing. Um, the the character on the left has a uh, a delta. I think that's when COVID was there a COVID delta. I think I'm losing track of all the different variations of. of it was. COVID. It was. We had a few Greeks. A COVID delta. So <laughs> there's a delta on that. This is when the COVID delta came out, and uh, whoops. Uh, it might have been the uh, Delta Vortex we had. <laughs> I don't know what it was. So these are people infected with COVID, and obviously in my brain. So um, there's a 19 on, on his shirt. Um, yeah, this is the next one. So um, moving on, I, I guess I started getting away from Delta and COVID and started drawing things that reminded me of my childhood and things like that. So again, I, I talked about how I, my father would take me to see horror movies and cowboy movies and stuff. And so I just started thinking of things to draw. And I'd go out West a lot. And um, there's a lot of Indian reservations out West and I'd go traveling around them when I visit my friends out West. And um, so I have an affinity for American Indians. Um, I'm not sure this is the way I should be painting them, but this is the visions that I had as a kid, uh, you know, of, of cowboys and Indians. Um, and I started, something I started doing, which was I started like drawing uh, in kind of monotones. And that was one of the first ones that I did. And this was another one that I did probably right after that. And um, this is a self-portrait of myself in monotone. So I, I just keep doing different things all the time. I don't really have any sense of continuity in a certain way. I think maybe my stuff looks like it comes from the same person. I, I'm not sure, but I just feel like I, I don't know what I'm doing sometimes when I'm doing it. And, and if I stop painting for a while um, and I pick it back up, it, it completely changes. Like I I, st I broke my foot like last September and I, and I was in pain for about three months and I just could not get my head into doing any art. And, um, and then after the three months, um, I still didn't paint for another three months. And just recently, um, literally within the last month, started painting again. And so that stuff will be at the end and you'll get to see it. But it's, it's really different because I think I forgot what I was doing and I just started doing other things. <laughs> no, that's a, it's a good point, Stephen. When you're in a groove, there's something great about it. When you're painting and whatever, if it's in a, obviously in a style for a little while, um, mm. but you lose something. You have blinkers on, and when you stop painting, in a way, it's the worst. But you you reset your memory, and so when you come back to the materials, the images, and the ideas, the approach, or how you do it, you change it up. Um, but I will say, as varied as your you know, tonal plays in the black and white field and your colorful, uh, the, you could tell a Stephen Hirsch. And that's sometimes an important signature of a painter. Uh, yes, this is quite, it seems quite different, but it's not. I mean, you, I, I think there is a, uh, a style with a lot of diverse expressions, but they read, uh, they read you. Yeah, I, I, I think the monsters became smaller. <laughs> <laughs> um and and you know i have a fascination with with uh figurative painting and figurative nudes and things like that so this was from that series of of uh, just do i do a lot of nudes so this is this yeah, is one i like your use of line you know it's when you do that line to encapsulate the form and go minimal let the background come through like you're doing and then your slight shading you get this uh it's not like a ghost image, but it's uh, it has a presence. Um, it has a presence more than a hyper-realistic painted image. It's, uh, mm. it, it's like you say, maybe from a dream. Um, yeah, I dream, as I said, I dream a lot. So, um, and, and I, try, I try to paint like I'm dreaming. I try to paint like I, I'm in a dream. And, and, and I guess this is, this is kind of, I try to work my head into some sort of state of mind that I'm always in a dream world or something like that. Or in a psychedelic world. And oh, stop talking. You're not saying anything. What's that? Sorry if your uh, mic is on. Just maybe shut it off if you have background conversation. Stephen, are, are you familiar with, uh, I mention it often, with Carl Jung's Red Book? No. So uh, many people aren't, but Carl Jung, the great you know, psych psychoanalyst, 
actually, you know, was obviously big into dreams, recorded his dreams in a book called The Red Book. I think it's actually at Yale University, but you can, you can see images from it. And it's very uh, free out of his mind, so to speak, out of his dreams. Yeah, and in I'm fact, not... can I, can, if I can interrupt a little bit, of course. Um, you can go see a copy of it at the Jung Library, mm -hmm. which is in New York. It's 28 East 39th Street. However, they are closed in August. And it is and worth, you, thank you. Thanks, Lily. It to... is, it's worth seeing that book. That Nobody associates Jung as an artist, but you, you're hitting, you'll see. You'll see so when you see it. What's it called again, Barry? What's the book called? Uh, the, I'll put it in the, it's uh, the Red Book. Carl Young, the Red Book, if you well, I know, it. I know, I know who Carl Young is. Um, but right, I, but you throw in the Red Book with it. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll get all this, you know, all those words. Right. Good uh, words, though. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, again, this is another nude. Another nude. It's, interestingly enough, there's lots of nudes here. So again, this is all um, watercolors uh, on on paper. Uh, this is a, a COVID uh, Delta uh, drawing or painting, I should say. It's all again all watercolors. So everything I do now is on paper. Um, and and now I'm using uh, watercolors instead of water, watercolor pencils. Though I do mix them up. I, I I use watercolor pencils and watercolors and sometimes acrylics and and things like that. Pencils. Stephen, would you say you're drawing or painting every day? Drawing. Like I said, Barry, I stopped for like six months, so I only think I picked it up like about two weeks ago or so uh, that I started up again. Um, I had COVID. Uh, for about three weeks, um, I broke my foot, so I've had a bed like six months, and um, I just wasn't, I just wasn't into it. I just wasn't into it. So I picked it up maybe about a week or two ago. Uh, some days, um, I, I, I kind of waste away the morning reading the Times or drinking coffee or reading the news or playing backgammon or something online. And I don't usually start painting till about one o'clock, and then I get in a frenzy because I like to paint by daylight. And then I always say like, well, you know, time's ticking away and I don't have much time left. So I frantically start painting or drawing. And some afternoons, and it's always in the afternoons, I'll make two, maybe one, two, or maybe even three uh, drawings. So this, this could be one of three drawings in an afternoon. I gotta say, I love the eyes in that last one, the way you went in and did the details, the lashes, those lines, and, you know, with the mouth next to it. And, uh, you know, it's good use of fine lines. A nice mm -hmm. detail. Yeah, that's where the pencils come in. I start to at first I I'll paint and then I'll start to work on it with pencils. Hey, uh, Barry, can I ask Tim uh, Steve a question? Of course, Mark. Yes, Barry. I noticed on some of these here that the drawing is done after the watercolor has dried. Right. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to draw into it. Uh, right. And I'm wondering if you don't then look at the watercolor shapes and have them suggest something to you. You hit it on the head. You absolutely hit it on the head. Very observant. Yeah, I do. I, I lay down watercolors sometimes. Um, not this one, but this one and this one. I lay down the watercolor sometimes to make figures. And then after, if I'm close to what the figure can be, I'll start drawing on top of that to maybe complete the figure. I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but I think you got it actually, totally got it. Yeah, I lay down the watercolors to make scenes and then I'll draw on top of it. Like if you look at this one to the left, this is actually, um, uh, this is from The Handmaid's Tale. I forget, forget the name of the character. He's that evil guy who's um, married to one of the main characters. He's one of the main characters. And then they chase him through the forest and they kill him. And uh, that's him on the left. And that's The Handmaid's Tale on the right, chasing him through the forest. So only one has red on her um and they're about to murder him and um i think i just painted it after the episode so yeah i that's exactly what i did yeah you hit it on the head yeah thank you yeah and yeah and the same with this yeah you can see it a lot of the, a lot of them 
and I, I actually consciously thought about it as a technique after a while because I started doing it, I guess subconsciously, but then I figured out what I was doing. And then I just started using it as a technique after that. I think this is one of those also where the figure is drawn after the background is laid down. Sometimes I lay the background down and I'm trying to make some sort of abstract painting. And I think like maybe I can get back to doing abstracts, but they never work out. So then I just start drawing on top of the abstracts or painting on top of the abstracts. And, and these last two are examples of, of that. Because I remember making them and I remember like, this isn't working out. And then I look at it and, and again, you hit it on the head. Um, the figures like her legs and things like that, they're all made from, or the pencil drawing over that is made from the strokes that were on the background. And you can see the strokes on the right side, which look like a leg, but it wasn't two of them. And then when I figured out, well, there's two of those strokes and that would make the legs. <laughs> um, this is um, Robert Durst and his, and his wife, uh, Kathy. I photograph Robert Durst. Um, I don't, if you don't know who he is, he's a fascinating character uh, who just died recently. He murdered his wife up in Westchester and there was a million stories about Robert Durst. And if you haven't read about him, he's an interesting guy to read about. Uh, anyway, this is, a, I photographed him many times and, and so I just wanted to paint him. And, and this is him laying next to his wife in bed who he killed. Hmm. couple of women at the pool. Um, I went to see a, uh, a performance art one night in, uh, in um, the meatpacking district and there were people performing in the windows and there was a, um, uh, a pole dancer performing in the window and pole dancing and that was the performance. And then I decided to paint the pole dancer without the pole. So this is called Polis Dancer. Go figure. Um, painting of his superhero. Um, I saw a show, I guess, on television about Oxycontin. And then I decided to draw this after watching that show. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, there are things in your life which like affect your entire life. And I guess people, baby boomers, the Kennedy assassination has changed everybody's lives. So I have a, a fascination with the Kennedy assassination books and reading books and watching movies and things like that, conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and then the Vietnam War was the other monumental event that changed our lives. And this is a take on the execution of uh, Viet Cong in um, Saigon. Yeah. yeah. Um, the war in Ukraine um, kind of blew my mind, I think like everybody else. And then I made all these next paintings are all about the uh, war in Ukraine. You know, I've got a comment on the variety of you, like keeping pace with a courtroom or what's happening politically 50 years ago or what's happening currently, and then contrasting that with your sort of uh, imagination play, dream play, um, other images, but bringing the same brush, you know, as a tool uh, for both. It's sort of a, it's a, it's a diverse playbook you draw from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, politics is a great uh, subject matter. Um, so these are people, they've been blown up and those are cluster bombs above them. They've lost their legs and their arms and things like that. This is a Ukrainian boy. Um, I was fascinated by the Z references uh, at the beginning. And um, and then just like Zorro was a childhood hero that I would watch on TV um, weekly, you know, like a huge show on TV. So 
I'm a big Zorro fan. And uh, then I just thought Z and Zorro and, and came up with this. And this is the first general who was killed by the Ukrainians. It was a big deal because he was the first general. Stephen, how did you come to the color on that painting, the green? Very strong. I'm just curious how you got there. I don't know. <laughs> I, I just like green. I like green. Green is one of my favorite colors. Yellow is one of my favorite colors. Um, I, I try not to, I, I don't draw anything realistically in a lot of cases. Like, you know, this is obviously not a portrait of somebody. Um, it looks maybe like it could be a passport photo, but only in my world. So I, I just lay down bright colors. I just like bright colors. Oops. They don't say that. I'm not sure where those lines came from. You're in a program, I think. Yeah, and I'm not sure how to get rid of them now. I don't know how to want do to that. stop screen share and come back? Whoops. Um, I've seen this happen. Yeah. Let me try that. Let me do that. I'll stop the screen share. Well, actually, the lines are still there. See if you could resolve that. And now, do you mind yeah, if I open fine. up to a couple of questions and then we'll jump back in? Yeah, oh. that's fine. While I get this rolling, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, we're back, actually. Yeah, but get. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, I, th I think I'm almost finished. I'm, I'm getting near the end. Um, again, Ukraine. And this is the colors of Ukraine, you know, blue and yellow. So everybody's wearing blue and yellow. So that's why I picked out these colors. I actually know an answer to why you actually did something. <laughs> now, you gave great answers. I mean, the, you know, you expressed it. You know, you sort of love for color, your love for green. And yellow, and as a painter, I can relate to yellow. It's sort of like my go-to highlight. And green is like my, often in works, it's my base. For you, you obviously love red, but it's, you like bright colors. You're making strong statements. You know, you're not uh, slow blending in the browns. But at mm. times you are. When you work in your black and white, you definitely are doing classical tonal, you know, play. Mm. Yeah, and this one, you can see it on the bottom. Yeah, it's a combination of both. So this is a California fire. You know, uh, these devastating pictures you see of like homes completely inflamed. And um, these people were, I think they were at a birthday party because the woman on the left has a a, 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 a birthday cake as a, as a, a head. Um, I forgot what I titled this. Um, but it, it had something to do with the head in the corner. I, I'd have to look at my Instagram to see what I titled it. So this is actually one of the new ones. So this was done maybe a week ago. So this is from the period after the six months of stopping of, of starting up again. So the next, all the next ones you'll see are, are just in the last week or two. So, um, I, I drew this and then I, I wrote things in the balloons that I thought were pretty, that would be inappropriate, not woke, as they say. And then I asked some people if I should publish it the way that I did it. And they said no. So I blacked out all the things I wrote in there. So I called this censored. Let's, let's see the uncensored one one day. <laughs> <laughs> well, the painting itself is uncensored still. So that's just censored after that. So, um, this is a, um, a summer in the Catskills. This isn't actually a new one. So when I said I'm making new ones, this is a brand new one. This was done like last week. So this is, I think this is the first painting I made after not painting for six months. And I think this is the last piece and it is, yeah. So I made this just a couple of days ago. So um, I ran out of uh, paper, drawing paper. So I ripped out a sheet from the Sunday Times Magazine and painted on top of it. And this was painted on top of uh, the Times Magazine paper. And which I kind of like because um, the paper is so thin 
that the watercolors, this is all watercolor, the watercolors started getting absorbed by the paper and it started um, curling inside and started rippling, which I, I kind of love the way that looks. <laughs> so that's it. Let me uh, stop. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. So, anybody has any questions? I, I'll gladly answer them. Yeah, Steve, which artists would you say are your soulmates that you have an affinity to? Um, I, I, you know, I'm so mainstream, I, I can't really say who. Um, because can I, can I throw that. out a few names? I'll just sound lame. I mean, you know, I'll say like Picasso and... Uh, you know, I'll just throw out like mainstream names because I just don't know what's going on out there. I just don't go to galleries that much and I don't pay attention to to the art world that much. I, I feel even I think I think Picasso is still considered a good painter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's still pretty good. He's still pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I have I to say this. Paint, this was a fascinating roller coaster ride. It was like um, Coney Island in a way, like a horror house and uh, the roller coaster. And I've never, I don't think I've ever seen an artist as much in touch with his unconscious mind as you are. It's really great to see. <laughs> That's it, I'm in touch with my unconscious mind. It's a good title for, for his show. For I think you, you, you just scratched the surface. What we just saw was just like a fraction of what's there. <laughs> yeah, maybe more dreams and more getting Maybe out. more, and, and there, as far as like artists, that, you, you know, and, and we talked about this, you know, a long time ago, but I would see, you know, if I saw the abstract phot photographs uh, uh, that you were taking too, there was a brief period where you were photographing abstract shapes and, you know, bits of paint on the street or whatever. And there was, uh, I saw like, Franz Klein, I saw, you know, Cy Twombly in some of the early pencil drawings. I saw de Kooning in the women drawings and paintings. And I just, I saw so many things. And the, the, the sensuality of the material is just, it's clear that you're like, you're so into the discovery. It's like, you're not setting out to like make something. It's just coming out, it's like, it's just coming straight from your head out into the whatever medium you're using, whether it's the 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 you know the the telescope cameras on the boardwalk or whether it's you know painting or you know pencil. It's it's just you have a way of like getting into it and using the material, and it's it's just gorgeous. It's great. I've been a fan for years. And and my mentor. I don't know why I don't know why these are not like on the auction block at Christie's. <laughs> I don't know either. You got to become the director of Christie's, Nancy. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that'll be the day. I wish. <laughs> why, I wish. Why not? Would... You should be. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy's a great friend and old friend and my mentor. When I was on Instagram, Nancy would um, look. I, I never, Nancy lived in New York and worked for Reuters and was a, you know, a big maca in the photo world, but I, I, I'm not a typical photojournalist, so I didn't really know anybody from Reuters. Well, and, uh, my background is I, I actually majored in painting. I went to art school. I went to School of Visual Arts. Keith uh, Haring was a classmate of mine, but then I had to make a living. So I ended up on the business side of photography. And for 14 years, I was the global head of photography for Reuters. But I kept watching all these interesting people on Instagram. And I think it was a Reuters photographer who turned me on to you, who was following you. And I'm like, oh, who is this guy? And you know, the, then the rest is history. Yeah, and then you would comment and you would go, well, that looks like Franz Klein and that looks like, you know. But it was so exciting and refreshing to see. It was like the best thing to see on Instagram. Well, as soon as you would tell me who they were, I would go, and Google their names and start looking at the work. I mean, I heard of Franz Klein. I'd never heard of Sam Francis and, you know, and Cy Twimbley and, and stuff like that. And, and but as soon as you told me who it was, I would like, you know, run over to Google and Google their names and look at their work. And I, I was never trying to copy it because I was always fascinated how you thought my work looked like that. 
And then, of course, the next week, it never looked like that again, probably. Right. <laughs> so it didn't last. And that's, just, that. and that's just fine. Yeah, I think the Sam Francis phase was about two paintings, and that was it. <laughs> that's okay. It's more about how you use the materials. Right, right, right. Well, I found figurative, and that, that's really where my heart was, and, and not abstract. Every time I try to do abstract, like uh, this gentleman said, well, they look like the back, like you painted the backgrounds first, and then you started drawing on top of them. And he, he so hit it on the head because the backgrounds are my my attempt to make abstract paintings sometimes. And then I look at it and I go like, what what's the point of this? What am I doing? This isn't really happening. I don't feel it. It's not working for me. I don't like it, blah, blah, blah. And then I just start using the background and start you know drawing on top of it and making a whole different piece out of it. But I do make that attempt every once in a while to kind of go back to trying to make uh, paintings of those splat photographs that I made. And I just- There's no rules. Them. There's no rules. It's like whatever you, you know, whatever you feel like. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. You, you gotta do a book. You gotta do a book because you gotta tell the stories. I mean, not just the outpatients of the mental hospital, but like, you know, seeing your first murder on the second day of your job at the New York Post and all the, you know, the racetrack. I mean, you, you know, you're, you're like, even if you had no pictures, the stories alone. You should write the autobiography. Uh, yeah. yeah, I am. Yeah. We'll talk. I, <laughs> we gotta find a publisher. Stephen, <laughs> Stephen, I want to thank you. That was a, a great presentation. And thank you everybody for coming, sharing, certainly both Mark and Nancy, great questions. Questions open people up and Stephen being open to that. And then of course, sharing your stories are brilliant. You've got so much micro and minutia in each photo because they were not, you know, it's beautiful to shoot the date or paint the date every day differently or to photograph the same tree as it changes. But you were presented with sort of top of the media images and absorbing it all and uh, relaying uh, and at the same time reaching your dream state sort of imagery and, uh, you know, not, not bashful with what you feel. And like me, we grew up in another era. And uh, Young points out it's very important not to suppress what you feel, but to express in some way, some socially right. acceptable right. way. And certainly the drawing is that, and you gain power by expressing these things as opposed to repressing them and sort of wasting energy. But either way, so much food for thought in your work and everybody thanks for coming i've got this talk will be on youtube check out my youtube channel if you need it it's my full name at gmail and i think just my full name is my youtube channel you'll never be able to spell it but good luck that's sort of like the test <laughs> um and uh steven thanks again thank you thank you thank you, thank thank you very you. much <laughs>